This is Space Time, Series 27, Episode 21, for broadcast on the 16th of February, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, we finally have an answer to the question, which came first, black holes or galaxies? Plans for a new, bigger, better super collider for CERN. And Japan's lunar lander wakes up, but then goes back to sleep again. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Well, it's been a question for decades. Which came first, supermassive black holes or the galaxies they're in the centre of? Now, new data from the Webb Space Telescope has finally shown that supermassive black holes not only existed at the dawn of time, they birthed new stars and supercharged galaxy formation. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, completely shakes up what astronomers know about galaxy formation. The insights upend theories of how black holes shaped the cosmos, challenging classical understanding that they formed after the first stars and galaxies emerged. Instead, it seems black holes might have dramatically accelerated the birth of new stars during the first 50 million years of the universe, a fleeting period with its 13.8 billion year history. The study's lead author, Joseph Silk from Johns Hopkins University, says we know these monster black holes exist at the centres of most, if not all, galaxies. But the big surprise is that they were present at the beginning of the universe and were almost like building blocks or seeds for early galaxy formation. He says they really boosted everything, like gigantic amplifiers of star formation, which is a major turnaround from what scientists thought was possible before. So much so that this could completely shake up science's understanding of how galaxies form. Silk says distant galaxies from the very early universe observed through Webb appear much brighter than scientists had predicted, and they reveal unusually high numbers of young stars and supermassive black holes. Conventional wisdom holds that the first black holes might have formed following the collapse of supermassive stars, and that galaxies formed after the first stars lit up the dark early universe. But the new analysis by Silk's team shows that supermassive black holes and galaxies coexisted, and they influenced each other's fate during the first 100 million years of existence. The authors say black hole outflows crush gas clouds, turning them into stars, and greatly accelerating the rate of star formation. Otherwise, it'd be very hard to understand where these bright galaxies came from because they're typically smaller in the early universe. Black holes are regions of space where gravity is so strong, nothing, not even light, can escape their pull. Hence the name. Because of this force, they generate powerful magnetic fields just beyond their event horizon, the point of no return beyond which matter falls forever into the singularity. These magnetic fields act like powerful particle accelerators, shooting material which hasn't yet reached the event horizon far out into space, often to cosmic distances. This process is likely why Webb's detectors have spotted more of these black holes and bright galaxies than anticipated. These enormous jets coming from black holes, often referred to as quasars and blazars, or simply active galactic nuclei, can crush nearby gas clouds, causing them to collapse on themselves and turn into stars. And that's the missing link that explains why these first galaxies appear so much brighter than what was expected. Silk's team now predicts the universe when it was young probably had two phases. During its first phase, high-speed outflows from black holes accelerated star formation, and then in the second phase, the outflows slowed down. A few hundred million years after the Big Bang, gas clouds collapsed because of the supermassive black hole's magnetic storms, and the new stars were born at rates far exceeding that observed billions of years later in our nearby galaxies. The creation of the stars slowed down because these powerful outflows transitioned into states of energy conservation, reducing the gas available to form stars and galaxies. Previously, the idea was that in the beginning, galaxies formed when a giant gas cloud collapsed. The big surprise is that there was a seed in the middle of that cloud, a big black hole, and that helped rapidly turn the inner part of the gas cloud into stars at a rate much greater than scientists had ever expected. And so, the first galaxies shone incredibly brightly. This is space-time. Still to come, a bigger, better super collider for CERN, 
and tiny NASA cameras will picture the interaction between a lunar lander and the moon's surface. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new feasibility study has supported a plan to build a new 17 billion US dollar particle accelerator, which will be far bigger and vastly more powerful than the Large Hadron Collider, currently the world's biggest atom smasher. The European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, is proposing a new 91 kilometer super collider, currently called the Future Circular Collider or FCC, which will be constructed in a tunnel deep beneath the Franco Swiss border. The existing 27-kilometre Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, discovered the long sought-after Higgs boson in 2012. The Higgs is a force particle that gives mass to other elementary particles through an all-pervasive Higgs field. But unlike all other bosons, the Higgs has no integer spin. The future circular collider would be three times as big as the LHC. It would generate collisions with significantly more energy output than previous circular colliders, such as the Super Proton Synchrotron, the Tevatron, and of course the Large Hadron Collider. Right now, the project's considering three possible scenarios for collision types. Hadron-Hadron collisions, including proton-proton and heavy ion collisions, electron-positron collisions, and electron-hadron collisions. In hadron-hadron collisions, each beam would have a total energy of 500 megajoules with a centre of mass collision energy of 100 tera-electron volts. That compares to 14 tera-electron volts at the LHC. The total energy output increases to 16.7 gigajoules, nearly a factor of 30 above the LHC. It's unclear what new types of physics the future circular collider might find. Theory gives no clear idea of what might be discovered at such high energies. But we do know the standard model of particle physics, the foundation stone of science's understanding of the universe, still contains many mysteries, including the true nature of gravity, as well as what dark energy and dark matter are, which is important as they make up 96% of the total matter-energy budget of the universe. This is Space Time. Still to come, tiny NASA cameras to picture the interaction between a lunar lander and the moon's surface, and Japan's lunar lander wakes up and then goes back to sleep again. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. In the vast expanse of the digital universe, your security is paramount. And so we want to welcome you to a new era of internet freedom and protection with NordVPN. Imagine navigating the cosmos without fear as NordVPN has shields up for your online voyage against cyber threats. In the process, ensuring your data remains encrypted even on uncharted networks. But that's not all. With our exclusive NordVPN birthday deal, you'll embark on a journey not just with enhanced security, but with four extra bonus months on us. Plus, you can store your discoveries in a private cloud, organize them into encrypted folders, and access your files across any device as seamlessly as traveling through space. And while you explore, our automatic backup keeps your data safe from black holes. Plus, even when disconnected from VPN, you can still block malware, trackers and ads thanks to NordVPN's advanced technology. All this with peace of mind and, of course, our 30-day money-back guarantee. Now, to grab this great offer and more, visit Nord's special space-time URL at nordvpn.com slash stuartgary. That's nordvpn.com slash stuartgary to join us at the frontier of internet security and freedom. That URL again, nordvpn.com slash Stuart Gary. NordVPN, explore the digital universe safely. And of course, there are links in the show notes and on our website. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time, Space Time with Stuart Gary. When the intuitive machine's IM-1 mission Nova C Odysseus lander descends down to the lunar surface later this month, four tiny NASA cameras aboard the spacecraft will capture every thrilling moment of the descent. 
Odysseus will attempt to become the first ever private spacecraft to successfully land on the lunar surface. The mission is part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services initiative designed to bring down the costs of science investigations and technology demonstrations going to the moon. As the Nova Sea lander descends towards the moon, the four tiny NASA cameras will be trained on the lunar surface. They'll be collecting imagery of how the surface changes as a result of interactions with the spacecraft's engine plume. Developed by NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, the stereo cameras for the Lunar Plume Surface Studies mission are an array of four cameras placed around the base of the lunar lander to collect as much imagery as possible during and after descent. See, as excursions to the moon increase and the number of payloads touching down near one another grows, scientists and engineers need to be able to accurately predict the effects of all these landings. How much will it change the lunar surface? For example, as the lander comes down, what happens to the lunar solar regular that it ejects? With very limited data collected during descent and landing so far, the project will be the first dedicated instrument to measure plume surface interaction on the Moon. The project's principal investigator, Michelle Monk, from NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate, says if humans are placing things, landers, habitats and so on near each other, they could wind up sandblasting equipment. And so that's driving requirements on protecting those and other assets on the lunar surface, which could add mass, and that mass will ripple through the architecture. The cameras will be focused on how the lander alters the surface of the moon during touchdown. It'll begin capturing imagery before the time the lunar lander's plume begins to interact with the surface until after the landing phase is complete. The final images will be gathered on a small onboard data storage unit before being sent to the lander for a downlink back to Earth. My name's Olivia Tyrrell. I'm a member of the photogrammetry team for the Stereo Cameras for Lunar Plume Surface Studies, or SCALPS for short. SCALPS is an array of small cameras that will be placed around the base of a lunar lander and collect imagery during the descent and landing of the vehicle. Using a technique called stereo photogrammetry, we can use those images to reconstruct a 3D shape of the ground. As the lander comes down, its hot engine plume will interact with the surface. Our cameras will begin acquiring images from before this interaction begins until after the vehicle has landed on the surface. The SCALPS cameras will specifically be looking at the overall crater formation and erosion of the ground due to the rocket plumes. The final stereo images, which will be stored on a small onboard data storage unit, will be transferred to the lander and then downlinked to Earth, where we can use them to reconstruct the overall erosion volume and shape of the ground. So this information is important because as we send larger, heavier payloads to the moon and eventually onto Mars, we need to be able to accurately predict the effects of these landings. With the Artemis program, we plan to establish a sustained lunar exploration and try to land multiple payloads in close proximity to one another. SCALP's data will be a critical part of understanding these phenomena and improving our computational models to inform these future landings. This is Space Time. Still to come, Japan's lunar lander wakes up, but then goes back to sleep again. And later in the science report, a new study finally answers the question, why are there always clouds of insects buzzing around your porch lights at night? All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, it seems Japan's lunar land has gone back to sleep after briefly awakening when sunlight finally reached its solar panels. The spacecraft landed on the moon two weeks ago, but a faulty propulsion system caused it to go out of balance during its final descent, and it ended up landing nose down. That prevented sunlight directly reaching its solar array, which it used to charge the probe's onboard batteries. It takes the moon roughly a month to orbit the Earth, so after two weeks of waiting, sunlight finally hit the solar panels, allowing them to charge the spacecraft's batteries. But the charge wasn't enough to keep the spacecraft awake for long. During a brief two-day awakening, the spacecraft successfully obtained first light from its multiband spectroscopic camera. Mission managers prioritised what they could target during the short operational window, downloading as much scientific data as possible. One of the mission's aims was to try and study an exposed area of the moon's mantle, the inner layer of the moon, usually deep beneath its crust. But as the battery power ran out, the probe went back into a dormancy period. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, says its lander, officially known as the Smart Lander for Investigating the Moon, or SLIM, was never designed to survive the long freezing lunar nights. 
So while mission managers are hoping the spacecraft has another chance to soak up some rays in two weeks' time, there remains a huge question mark as to whether it can survive another fortnight-long lunar night. The mission's other priority was achieving a more accurate landing, rather than simply targeting a landing zone several kilometres across. And JAXA says SLIM landed just 55 metres from its target, meaning a far more precise touchdown than has ever previously been possible. The Japanese success of sorts follows last month's failure of US firm Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander, which began leaking fuel shortly after separating from its Falcon 9 upper stage. And a short time later, some sort of explosive event, possibly related to the propellant loss, also occurred on board, dooming the mission, which swung around the moon instead of landing on the lunar surface, and then burnt up as it re-entered Earth's atmosphere above the South Pacific Ocean. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has found that by replacing half of your animal consumption with alternative protein sources over the next 25 years would free up heaps of farming land for renewable energy generation and carbon removal. A report in the journal One Earth looked at the viability of a carbon dioxide removal method called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which involves cultivating fast-growing crops to capture and store carbon, and also using biomass as a feedstock for renewable energy. But to do this successfully will require lots of land. And so researchers estimated how much land could be freed up by simply switching out of different percentages of animal consumption with protein alternatives. And they found that simply replacing 50% of animal products could free up enough land to generate renewable energy equivalent to today's total coal-generated power. However, more work still needs to be done on the specifics of which protein alternatives could be used to reduce meat consumption. A new study claims men who eat kimchi up to three times a day could lower their risk of obesity. The study, reported in the British Medical Journal, analysed the self-reported diets of over 100,000 middle-aged Koreans and compared them with their body mass index, looking specifically at the amount of kimchi, a Korean fermented vegetable dish, was eaten. The authors claim that for men, between one and three servings per day of any type of kimchi was associated with a lower risk of obesity. And they say that a higher intake of kakaduji, a radish type of kimchi, was associated with a lower risk of abdominal obesity in both men and women. However, they warned that too much kimchi, likely over five servings a day, was still associated with a higher risk of obesity. And that could be the result of higher salt content or simply the result of eating too much food. It's also important to point out that this study was funded by the Korean government-backed World Institute of Kimchi. Scientists have finally shed light on why there's always a cloud of insects buzzing around your porch lights at night. It's been a mystery since Roman times. They used to set up lights to trap the insects. Now, a report of the journal Nature Communications claims artificial lights makes it hard for flying insects to orient themselves to the horizon. Scientists reached their conclusions after using high-speed infrared cameras to track insects' flight in three dimensions, both in the wild and in the lab. They found that insects tend to correct their course so that their backs are facing towards a light source. When that light source is the sun, this allows them to hold a steady flight path oriented towards the horizon. But artificial light means they're constantly and erratically correcting their flight paths, causing vertigo and making it appear that artificial lights are attracting them. You can therefore improve the lives of insects by simply keeping your artificial outdoor lighting at night to a minimum. It seems a lot of household paranormal activity has far more to do with your home's electrical system than what it does with supernatural visitations. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says there's a whole bunch of common everyday problems which are often put down to ghostly visitations rather than home maintenance. Yeah, you might be surprised that that a skeptic would think there might be other explanations for paranormal phenomena, but there's a suggestion there's a number of phenomena that people associate with paranormal activity in your home. Green goo, flickering lights, unexplained smells. Green goo is what might be coming out of a power point or a light fitting or something like that. It sort of seeps out and people say, oh my, you know, ecto. Ectoplasm. <laughs> ectoplasm, my favourite. Ectoplasm could be there and it could be sort of seeping out. But the one suggestion was, no, it's not ectoplasm. It's copper wiring that might be going off. 
copper wire that's it's been there for a long, long time. Yeah. yeah, it's actually sort of putting out this copper oxide, isn't it? And putting out this green goo that is sort of coming out and sort of, it might look not very pleasant, but it might be a pretty ordinary thing. Flickering lights is something that people always sort of associate with ghost, yeah, sort of ghost films and stuff. Yeah, as, as soon as the lightning strikes and that sort of stuff and the lights flicker on and off, you think, oh my God, ghost activity. Well, that could be bad wiring as well. That you've got some loose connections somewhere, so maybe you should go and look at that rather than instantly assume that you're getting a ghost in the house. And a third one is unexplained smells, which... Um, I yeah, always blame the dog. <laughs> I don't have a dog. I blame me. But never mind. And you yeah, the wife blames you. <laughs> Everybody blames me. But if you look at the Conjuring films, the, the guy Ed Warren there, who's the main sort of Ghostbuster in that in those films, etc., always assumed there was a demon when he had a bad smell. It was a demon instantly. Would say, "Ah, oh, it's a demon," which is very handy for him because he could actually go and therefore um, exorcise the house and get rid of the demons. Unexplained smells could be for a number of reasons. Say you've left food out somewhere, right, or your fridge has gone off. It doesn't matter how much food is rotting in the fridge or anything, as if it's a bad smell, it's a demon. It's an interesting uh, concept, rotting food in the fridge. I've never had food in the fridge long enough for that to happen. <laughs> oh, things at the back, you know, that you've forgotten uh, about. No problem. Interesting thing is the suggestions about what these paranormal things might really be and how to solve them all come from an electrician <laughs> who is perhaps working up some business for himself. Yeah, do you get a green goo? Do you get flickering lights? Do you get unexplained smells? You need an electrician, right? So it's, it's a very down to earth sort of solution to a well, again, if you're getting an electrical short, that would give a, a burnt smell through the house as well, yeah. No, he's it probably is. Totally, yeah. totally, so, totally I mean, right, it's... totally spot on. So, yeah, so, so the, yeah, an electrician solution might be the best thing to go for. There are other things, of course, other phenomena that you might associate with visions and things like that, especially when people are half asleep. That's been discussed a lot of times. Sleep paralysis is a thing where you're half asleep and you can't move, you get a bit panicky, you can't move your arms and legs, you feel you're being pressed upon by ghosts and things. That's, that's not that uncommon and it's associated with these wake sleep. I thought they were supposed transition. to be aliens that were transporting you. Know, you alien, to used to be incubi or succubi okay. in the old days. Demons sort of coming and sitting and doing terrible things to you. Or well, with this you. is this is the thing with paranormal activity, isn't it? It depends what's trendy at the time that the experience is based on. Very much. I mean, we mentioned green goo, and that sounds like ectoplasm, which was the stuff that the old spiritualists used to exude from their nose or their ear or whatever, and it's sort of like a chewing that's gum. That's not funny. <laughs> it looks like chewing gum instead of... But that's, that's disappeared. Ectoplasm seems to have been very young. They disappeared from the scene, and I don't know why, but ne never mind. Uh, but one thing someone did do was an experiment suggesting that tall ceilings, dark lighting, and cold are a good way to encourage belief or ceilings that your house is haunted or there's paranormal things going on. To the extent that someone did an experiment where they built a room with tall ceilings, dark lighting and cold air coming in and to see what sort of reaction people got. And they're saying that within 40, 50 minutes, people started feeling uneasy and that there were strange things going on. And of course, as usual with these scientific experiments, these reactions happened even if there was nothing happening. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the room. They could even do it with virtual reality by having, a, you know, by looking at a picture of a tall ceiling, dark lighting, you would get sort of spooky feelings. So it's nothing to do with actually being in the room or anything like that. There's a lot of things that would encourage people to have paranormal beliefs, and most of them have pretty prosaic explanations, especially if you're an electrician. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. 
You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 